Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Peggy Ward, and I'm an antitrust uh, attorney uh, at Jones Day here in Washington, D.C., and I'll be moderating this afternoon's panel discussion. Um, the Federalist Society has put together a panel of talented and experienced antitrust practitioners uh, to examine the current state of merger enforcement at the FTC. Uh, we'll look at this issue today primarily through the lens of three recent merger enforcement actions. Um, equitable Resources, People's Natural Gas, uh, a proposed merger of two natural gas utilities uh, companies uh, that was abandoned by the parties after a federal court of appeals uh, stayed the merger pending a reconsideration of the district court's um, dismissal of the case. Uh, the second case we'll be talking about is a Whole Foods Wild Oats, uh, a merger of uh, two super premium uh, organic uh, supermarkets, Paul can correct me uh, <laughs> as far as the market <laughs> definition. Um, uh, uh, a merger that which a federal district court uh, refused to enjoin, uh, and that matter is, is uh, still uh, continuing as the FTC is uh, uh, pursuing an appeal of that decision, although the parties have, have since merged. Uh, also, Evanston uh, Northwestern Highland Park, a hospital merger which the FTC successfully challenged several years after the merger had occurred, uh, but where the remedy was not an unwinding of the deal, but rather uh, the Commission had ordered that the parties must maintain separate managed care contracting groups going forward. Um, so we'll examine what these cases tell us about the state of current FTC merger practice. Um, is the Commission challenging the right transactions and protecting consumers? Um, are courts functioning as an unnecessary uh, obstacle to merger enforcement or uh, as an appropriate check on agency authority? Um, each of the speakers will offer some opening remarks, uh, followed by a question and answer period, including questions from the audience. Um, John Delacorte will kick things off uh, by discussing the Equitable Resources Natural Gas Case. Uh, John is a special counsel in Kelly Dry's Antitrust Group. He previously served as Chief Antitrust Counsel in the FTC's Office of Policy Planning. Um, John also serves as chair of the Antitrust Subcommittee of the Corporation Securities and Antitrust Practice of the Federal Society and is also a vice chair of the ABA Antitrust Sections and Exemptions and Immunities Committee. Uh, we'll then turn the program over to Paul Dennis, um, who will talk about the FTC's challenge of the uh, Whole Foods Wild Oats uh, case. Um, Paul is co-chair of Deckard's Antitrust and Competition Group. Um, he previously served in the Antitrust Division uh, at the U.S. Department of Justice and is active in the ABA's Antitrust Section. Um, Paul is certain to have some unique insights uh, about the Whole Foods case, having led uh, Deckard's defense uh, of the merger uh, on behalf of Whole Foods. Uh, then Chul Pak will discuss the FTC's challenge in the Evanston Northwestern Healthcare case. Um, Chul is a partner at Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati. Um, he previously served as the assistant director of the Mergers 4 division at the FTC, where he was the lead trial lawyer in the Evanston case, which, by the way, is the first successful challenge of a hospital merger by a government agency since the uh, 1980s. Um, we'll then conclude the opening remarks with some comments from Edwin Rockefeller. Um, Ed will share his views on, on, uh, on the broader context of antitrust merger enforcement and the standards applied by the agencies. Um, after starting out his career with the CIA and the Army, Ed practiced law um, uh, in Washington, D.C. for about 40 years, four of which were spent at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, he's also the chairman of the advisory board of BNA's Antitrust and Trade Regulation Report, a position he has held uh, since the board was organized in 1961. Uh, we'll then have the question and answer period, uh, uh, including, I hope, some good questions from the audience. And with that, I will turn the program over to John. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Peggy. And uh, as, as Peggy mentioned, I will say a few words about the uh, equitable resources, people's natural gas case. Um, first, I'll say a few words about the, the nature of the transaction. Um, it was a merger of two natural gas utilities in western Pennsylvania. Uh, Equitable Resources was the acquirer. They sought to acquire people's natural gas. And because of the unique history of this area of western Pennsylvania, uh, there was actually a situation in which uh, redundant natural gas 
networks had been built out, uh, something that's unusual in other parts of the country. Um, this was due to the presence of large industrial gas users at the time. Uh, when those industries left, uh, that created some capacity that was available from the competing networks to serve other customers. As a result, you ended up with so-called gas-on-gas competition. Consequently, when Equitable and Peoples uh, proposed their merger, one seeming consequence of this was that, uh, according to the FTC, 500 customers uh, would experience the merger as, as a, uh, the complete elimination of gas-on-gas -gas competition. That is, it would be, for those 500 customers, a merger to monopoly. Now, I've, I've noted that it's 500 customers. That maybe understates it a bit in that these were not just 500 individual residences. Rather, it was 500 uh, institutional customers, so some of them were large businesses and schools and that sort of thing. All of this uh, set the stage for regulatory conflict because uh, due to the nature of the transaction, there were two different sets of laws that the parties needed to comply with. First, under the Pennsylvania Public Utility Code, merging utilities are required to obtain a Certificate of Public Convenience from the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission, or PUC. The PUC evaluates a transaction under the public interest standard. At the same time, a merger of, uh, of uh, appropriate size and meeting other conditions uh, it, in that case, the parties will be required to make a filing under the Hart Scott Rodino Act um, and will be required to make it with either the Federal Trade Commission or the Department of Justice, in this case, the FTC. The FTC, in contrast to the Pennsylvania PUC, evaluates the transaction pursuant to the antitrust statutes aided by the DOJ FTC horizontal merger guidelines. So this kind of sets the stage for the conflict. Um, what happened here, as, as uh, Peggy discussed briefly in her opening remarks, is that uh, the PUC uh, was moving a little faster in their process and actually went ahead and approved the merger. At that point, when the FTC raised its concerns, the um, parties uh, filed a motion to dismiss on state action grounds. And uh, what is the state action doctrine? Well. It is a judicially crafted doctrine that is intended to resolve situations just like this one. That is, situations in which you have a conflict between a state regulatory structure and uh, the overarching antitrust enfor enforcement authority provided by federal law. Under the state action doctrine, generally, federal antitrust law and state re where federal antitrust law and state regulation conflict, the antitrust laws must give way. Now, that's not always the case. Um, and so in order to determine where there is a genuine conflict, where the state regulatory structure and the antitrust laws are pulling in totally different directions, uh, the Supreme Court has articulated a two-part test in the Mid-Cal case. And that two-part test holds that the party that is seeking to uh, oust the antitrust laws through application of the state action doctrine must demonstrate two things. First, that there is a clearly articulated state policy dis to displace competition with something else, some other regulatory priority. And second, that the state engages in active supervision of the conduct. So here, the merging parties argued that the Pennsylvania Public Utility Code uh, was a clearly articulated state policy to replace uh, the background antitrust laws with the more specific enforcement authority of the PUC. And secondly, they said that even after the parties merged, uh, there would be act active supervision, um, in fact, quite pervasive uh, supervision in the form of PUC oversight, which would include uh, the setting of rates, or at least the supervision of rates. I should note how also that there is one key limitation on the clear articulation prong of the Medcal test, and that is that uh, that under a, another Supreme Court, Parker versus Brown, another Supreme Court case, Parker versus Brown, the state policy cannot simply be nullification of the antitrust laws. That is, uh, if the state wants to come forward with some other uh, regulatory pr objective, whether it be protection of health and safety um, <clears throat> or some other important goal, then that's fine. But the state can't simply say that this se segment of our economy or these particular entities are exempted from antitrust enforcement. So how did that all play out uh, in this particular case? Well, I think I can illustrate that with a, a, a short timeline. I won't give you all the critical dates. But uh, it starts off on uh, March 1st of 2006, when Equitable and Peoples proposed their merger. 30 days later, uh, the merging parties filed for a certificate of public convenience with the Public Utility Commission. On March 14th of 2007, so now already almost a year later, the FTC files an administrative complaint alleging that the merger agreement violates the antitrust laws. Um, 
Now, the FTC had been working in conjunction with the PUC, so they were aware, well aware of the action that was going to take place shortly, which was a month later, the PUC granted the certificate of public convenience, indicating that they had, in fact, approved the merger. On the same day, the FTC filed for a preliminary injunction in district court. At that time, this is when uh, the parties raised their state action defense, saying that the uh, commission's complaint should be dismissed on state action grounds. That matter was adjudicated, and the district court uh, actually sided with the merging parties, holding that uh, the motion to dismiss was granted on state action grounds. Of course, that didn't bring an end to the matter. Next, the FTC appealed that decision to the Third Circuit and it obtained, obtained a preliminary injunction of the merger, preventing the parties from consummating the transaction while the appeal was taking place. In August of 2007, the, uh, the matter was briefed. The state action issue continued to be uh, addressed by the parties. In October of that year, uh, oral argument took place before the Third Circuit. And then while there was an expectation that this was coming to a conclusion, the parties at that point waited. They waited one month and then two months, three months. Finally, in January of this year, January 15, 2008, Equitable and Peoples ultimately said they'd had enough. They said that this process was taking too long, it was too distracting, it was too expensive, and they ultimately ended up abandoning their, abandoning their transaction. Adding insult to injury, uh, a month later the FTC, uh, saying that the, the case or controversy was now moot, asked that the Third Circuit vacate the uh, favorable state action decision, and the, uh, the, the court went ahead and did that. <coughs> So with that sad history uh, uh, to account for, why do we call this a win? Well, if you look at it from the FTC's perspective, the FTC got what it wanted. The FTC prevented a transaction it regarded as anti-competitive, and furthermore, it succeeded in vacating an unfavorable state action opinion. I would also go a little further, and this is my own editorial input here, is that I think that the district court got it wrong on state action. So I, I wouldn't necessarily be too concerned that that opinion was vacated. Um, the district court's opinion, uh, I think, reduced the uh, clearly articulated state policy requirement of the Mid-Cal test to mere lip service. That is essentially what the court said was that uh, the PUC was required to evaluate the transaction under a public interest standard, which included consideration of competition concerns. The PUC undertook this analysis and essentially said, well, in this instance, a merger to monopoly is in the best interest of competition and is in the best interest of consumers. I think if you uh, were to permit, or if, if the courts were to permit that type of superficial analysis, then really all they're saying is that the clearly articulated prong requires a, uh, a kind of meaningless going through the motions. Secondly, I think the, uh, the district court opinion created some mischief, or would have created some mischief had it not been vacated, because it, uh, it exacerbates an existing problem with antitrust law that I'm hopeful um, Ed Rockefeller will talk a little bit about, which is that there are not uh, clear rules for uh, antitrust enforcement. I mean, that's certainly a problem in other areas of law, but I think it's particularly acute in the antitrust area. And here we have an example where there was a clear rule that there must be a clearly articulated state policy that pulls in the opposite direction of antitrust, and the court muddied that up. So it was a win, but it was an ugly win. Now, why was it an ugly win? Well, it's hard to cheer the use of a burdensome, drawn-out process to force parties to abandon a transaction. I think even the FTC litigating staff would say that's not how they want to achieve results. They like for the, to persuade a judge to agree with their opinions, not to merely use the process itself to achieve, achieve the result they want. But before um, those of us here in the audience jump on board with the district court and say that the opinion was great and the, that the uh, uh, results the district court was advocating were fine, I would add two qualifiers to that. Two concerns about, uh, about the world proposed by the district court. That is, first, for those who consider themselves free market proponents, the district court's approach obviously considered, obviously, arguably considered a uh, uh, consisted of re-regulation, not deregulation. And what I mean by that is you had an existing situation where you had uh, competing businesses and that was the action that was protecting consumers. The district court essentially said it would be fine to allow a merger to monopoly eliminating that competition because consumers would still be protected by a regulator. I think many people would agree that uh, competition is the superior approach in that particular dynamic. And then secondly, and of particular interest to a Federalist Society audience, 
I think um, those who consider themselves textualists, and I'm going to use the A word here, uh, those who consider themselves textualists, textualists might consider this opinion to be activism. And the reason for that is I think you don't, one doesn't have to read between the lines too much in looking at this opinion to see that it was motivated by two principal concerns by the district court. One is a concern that there really wasn't that much competition at stake here. It was only 500 customers. And secondly, a real irritation with the fact that the FTC as the federal enforcer was sticking its nose into the state's business and telling the state what it should and should not do. And those are maybe important things to think about, but that's simply not the job of the judge. The judge's job was to look at the state action doctrine as it's been outlined in the prior cases and apply it as such. The judge didn't do that here, but rather, in my view, discovered a new and seemingly super state action doctrine to easily dismiss the case on, uh, on state action grounds and dispense with it on his docket altogether. So with those thoughts out there, um, I look forward to questions and answers, and I'll turn the floor over to Paul. Thank you. Let me uh, adjust our slides here. This is John's computer, so I'm not used to the, the touch. It's a little more sensitive than I'm used to. There we go. Let's get this into. There we go. Uh, so as Peggy said at the outset, I'm going to talk about Whole Foods case, which we uh, litigated last summer on behalf of Whole Foods. Uh, Peggy alluded to the procedural history of the case. Uh, we were in court on the FTC's motion for preliminary injunction to block the merger of Whole Foods and Wild Oats. Uh, those two supermarket operators were differentiated from most other supermarkets by their focus on natural and organic products. And that became the focus for the FTC's market definition in the case uh, and the source of fairly considerable dispute between us and, and the FTC. Uh, my firm was retained after the complaint was filed, and when we first got into the case, uh, we quite literally did not know what we were getting into. Uh, the complaint, which I put up here, was filed under seal, and uh, the public version was redacted in substantial part, but there was this big redaction in the first paragraph. And when we looked at it, we read it and said, right before the blackout, it said, Whole Foods Chief Executive Officer John Mackey bluntly advised the Board of Directors of the purpose of this acquisition, and they blacked out the rest. <laughs> well, that was not a good sign. Uh, we figured we had some significant challenges ahead based on our own documents. And as we got into this case, uh, we would learn a little bit more about where the FTC was coming from. They were significantly focused on uh, a small number of internal documents from the company. Uh, they also fell in love with some anonymous posting done by Mr. Mackey on the Yahoo Finance chat board under the pseudonym of Raho Deb. Uh, if any of you have spent any time on these, these chat boards, you know what the level of discourse is on the chat boards. And uh, so there's a lot of colorful colorful stuff on the, on the chat boards that became the subject of a lot of attention from the FTC. Uh, but their theory, if I can summarize it quickly, and I know there are FTC people here who will probably correct me, but I've only got eight to ten minutes, so you've got to cut me a little slack here. Uh, their, their theory was that these two firms were each other's closest rivals in something that they called premium, natural, and organic supermarkets. Uh, this is a term that nobody had ever heard of before. It was invented for the purpose of this case. Uh, and they rested their case very heavily on these small number of documents. They also had some econometric evidence that I won't talk about, which I think turned out to be not nearly as good as they were hoping it would be. But we had a little difficulty figuring out what premium natural and organic supermarkets actually meant. Uh, so we had to have a discovery fight with the FTC to get them to tell us what it meant. And Judge Friedman ordered them to actually explain to us what the market was that they were defining. And th this was their answer. Uh, they, they ticked off a number of factors each time prefaced by generally that this was the case in premium. We didn't make this up, okay? This was their answer. Uh, and these are all really vague and very difficult to apply. As if it wasn't bad enough, at the end of their answer, they, they added that 
not all the stores in the relevant market would possess all of these characteristics or to the same uh, degree or level. So we were quite confused by this, but that was their answer, and we were happy to litigate on the basis of this answer. Uh, all I could conclude was they certainly knew it when they saw it, but we certainly did not. Um, what the, this market definition resulted in was a rather curious construct. You had only four firms in the entire United States who qualified as premium natural organic supermarkets. Uh, the merging parties, who were in green and purple on this map, they're not terribly distinct, uh, depending on your angle on it. Uh, then New Seasons, which is a small company that was all, entirely in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and then Earth Fair, which was down in the southeast. Uh, when we started thinking about the implications of this, we realized that each of these companies operated monopolies. Uh, if you looked at the FTC's geographic market definition, it was a six mile radius round stores. Uh, so we analyzed all 274 premium natural organic supermarkets. That's out of about 34,000 supermarkets in the US. Uh, this market was that small. And we found that each company had some monopolies, one or more monopolies. Uh, this became a, a, a focus of our attention in terms of how to build our defense because the antitrust laws are supposed to prevent the formation of monopolies because monopolies are bad in some competitive sense. So we said let's look at the monopoly markets as defined by the FTC and the non-monopoly markets and let's see if they're different. Is there anything about the behavior of the parties that suggests that they recognize this awesome monopoly power that they have in so many markets? Uh, so we decided that we had to focus on market realities and how those markets actually worked. Uh, and we, we picked on a, a few things that turned out to be quite insightful in terms of understanding how the parties compete. Site selection, how they picked new store sites, how they built their competitive strategy, how they actually priced. Turns out that they don't price based on the presence or absence of each other and their prices didn't vary depending on whether they faced each other. Uh, we looked at what happened when they entered each other's markets, uh, and we looked at who the customers were and what the customers said about themselves and their preferences and where they shopped and what they bought at where they shop. I'm not gonna be able to go into all of the detail of that, but we did it through what we called real testimony from real people. This slide was a roadmap that we gave to the judge to help him figure out uh, what testimony was relevant to which market. Each city that's identified on here had a, one or more relevant markets in it. And we had declarations from the regional presidents for the various Whole Foods regions. And so if you wanted to know something about Boulder, Colorado, you'd go read Will Paradise's declaration and see what he said about how he actually competed in the marketplace and see the ordinary course documents that he included with his declaration that showed exactly what was going on in the marketplace. So this was our little roadmap for the judge to help him find his way through the evidence. Uh, we also spent a fair amount of time in the closing comparing this case to a successful merger challenge that the FTC had launched against the Staples Office Depot merger back in the late 90s. Uh, there are some significant similarities between the cases in that you were talking about a specialized retailer who was alleged to occupy a market uh, uniquely separate from other retailers selling the same products. But we, this slide is actually the conclusion of a, a buildup we did. Each time we made one of these points, we would come back to the slide and build the next level. So uh, the judge got quite accustomed to seeing it. He started laughing by the time he saw it about the third or fourth time. Uh, but these, this slide highlighted some very significant differences between our case and the Staples case that are important for antitrust analysis. Uh, in particular, Pricing really mattered in Staples. Pricing was different whether they competed with other office supply superstores or not. In our case, the prices didn't vary. Uh, they had price zones. We didn't have price zones. When they studied new markets, they looked at other office supply superstores. We have big fat documents, one for each relevant market, analyzing all the other supermarkets in the market. How many checkout counters they had, how many parking lot spaces they had which we did whether it was a monopoly market or not. Uh, so the, the comparison was quite striking and suggested there, there is a way to make out a case based on you know, a particular channel of distribution, but that case wasn't made out here. Uh, 
So the district court picked up on this, and these are just a, a few snippets of quotes out of the district court opinion. You know, market realities became the judge's touchstone. He kept coming back to how the marketplace actually worked in deciding the case, rather than looking at some hyperbolic documents uh, or some econometrics that he couldn't possibly understand. Uh, what I take away from this, if I'm going to make one point about this case, and given the time we've got here, I'll leave it at one, is that market realities really trump these little talismanic indicators that have gotten, been popular over the years in antitrust. And, you know, Ed Rockefeller is a better historian on this than I am, but w when I started in this business, market concentration was the be-all and end-all. You had the Philadelphia National Bank presumption, and the government would get up in court, they'd define a market, they'd measure concentration, and then they'd want to sit down say, I'm entitled to presumption uh, because this is the most important indicator there is. Uh, over time, the government kind of got away from that. We shifted to the number of competitors. We had a phase where customer complaints were the thing. Uh, and I think you know, cases like Oracle and Arch Coal have you know, put that back in its place. And we have the hot documents phase. And our case, I think, was, in the FTC's eyes, a hot documents case. Uh, each of these things are relevant to antitrust analysis. I won't dispute their relevance, but I think they became overly important in how the government analyzed cases and how they litigated cases, and it was a huge mistake. Uh, and if you think I'm exaggerating, take a look at this FTC report on horizontal merger investigation data and look at the way they analyzed their own cases. And they broke down the cases based on you know, what was the market concentration evidence, which cases were based on customer complaints, which cases were based on hot documents. It's how they look at their own cases. Uh, they failed to look at how the markets were really working. And I think that is really the fundamental problem the government's had litigating these cases in recent years. Thank you, Paul. Um, Joel? Um, thank you. So the case that I'm going to talk about is Evanston Northwestern Healthcare. It's a hospital merger. These are two hospitals located in the northern suburbs of Chicago. Evanston Northwestern ENH is what we called it, acquired a uh, fairly small local community hospital called Highland Park and together the, the, the most important thing to remember about these hospitals is that the three of them form what we always call the geographic triangle. Highland Park was up here, Evanston was down here, its sister hospital, Glenbrook, was right about here. They formed this triangle. In between, there are no other hospitals, lots of suburban communities in between. But then surrounding the three hospitals are tons of hospitals, okay? And I remember from when I did the opening statement, you use maps to try to show what, what's the place look like. And I can't do it here because it's under seal and confidential, but of course, we would show a map of saying, here's where the three hospitals are, bop, 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 and somewhere outside there, just there's some hospitals because they're really far apart. We zoom in, of course. And the respondents, the uh, Evanston lawyers, would come in and they zoom out, of course, and they show all of Chicago, and you see hundreds of hospitals all over the place. You know, to, but that's the idea of where we were coming from. And that had a critical point because the key question was, within competition among these hospitals, and the competition was to try to secure contracts with payers, Blue Cross, United Health, et cetera. That's the level of competition we were going for. The question was, how much did it matter that these two hospital systems were right next to each other? And what impact did the presence of all these surrounding hospitals have on the marketplace? Did it matter at all that these two companies would merge and become one entity? Would they gain greater leverage against Blue Cross, Blue Shield, against United Health, so as to be able to ask for higher reimbursement rates in the following years? Or would all these surrounding hospitals, and there are a lot of surrounding hospitals, would they be sufficient constraints so that if ENH post-merger tried to raise prices, 
Blue Cross, Blue Shield would stop and say, no, you're not going to get those price increases. We're going to take our people, our enrollees, people like everybody here, and switch them over to the adjacent hospitals. That's the fundamental question. And you heard Paul speak about, for example, Whole Foods. It's a very similar exercise. If these two companies merge, will so many people switch out in the face of a price increase so that the price disciplining effect will naturally occur through the existence of other competitors? It's this classic unilateral effect story. Okay? So that's how we approach the case. Our case was a little different because it was a consummated merger. The merger occurred in 2000. The two hospitals integrated their systems. We learned about the merger and we started our investigation 2003, maybe 2004. The trial occurred, it's been a while now, so I, I think it's like 2006, 2007. And that was always one of the problems with the case. The two hospitals had merged. Um, everyone had moved on. So that's why this panel calls it a tie, because ultimately we did think and did prove that there were anti-competitive effects with the merger, meaning post-merger, from 2000 on till about 2005 when the data stopped, we were able to show that the price increases that these two hospitals obtained from Blue Cross, Blue Shield, United Health, Aetna, Cigna, et cetera, were significantly higher than the price increases of all the other surrounding hospitals to the same health plans. In other words, the merger and the elimination of that direct head-to-head -head competition between these two hospitals did matter, and it did permit those hospitals to get higher price increases than everybody else because of their geographic location. And I won't get into all the details of exactly how the hospital market industry works, but the point being, I think we established anti-competitive effects, a post-merger, real-world actual price increases that were obtained simply because of the merger and not because of anything else. The problem was they had merged. They had integrated a lot of their their uh, operations. So the question was, well, what do you do now? Traditionally, when you have a consummated merger, traditionally the remedy, if you have anti-competitive effects, <coughs> is to order a divestiture, split them apart. And another case that preceded my case was Chicago Bridge and Iron, where two entities merged. These two entities manufactured uh, storage tanks for LNG, LPG, various types of uh, gases. Those two entities merged. Anti-competitive effects were found, and the FTC ordered the two companies to then divest itself and recreate a new independent competitor. And that was the position that at the staff level we recommended in the Evanston case. We said there are anti-competitive effects, order the divestiture, make Highland Park separate again, separate ownership, etc. Return it back to its independent status. And the commission uh, disagreed with us and in this particular situation felt that the quality of care concerns with respect to hospitals um, were very real, very serious, and they were concerned that if you broke the two hospital systems apart, there might be quality of care deterioration. People's lives might be endangered if you had separate ownership now, during the, or at least during the course of the transition period, to separate ownership. And in this instance, they believed that quality of care trumped the anti-competitive effects, the higher prices, um, and decided that we are not going to order a divestiture we're going to require that they create separate negotiating teams. They'll still be under one ownership, but each hospital will have to negotiate with the health plans separately. So that's why it's considered a, a tie. You won on liability, but you didn't win on remedy. Uh, you didn't get the divestiture that you were seeking. Both sides got something out of it. Beyond the specifics of this case, there are a couple of themes that came out of the case that I think are very interesting. One, 
First and foremost, what drove this particular case was the desire by the Federal Trade Commission to both re-energize hospital merger enforcement, but also set new law. And what I mean by that is throughout the course of the 1980s and many parts of the 1990s, the Department of Justice, the Federal Trade Commission, and various state agencies went to federal district court to try to block hospital mergers throughout the country. New York, California, uh, various places in the Midwest. And systematically, the federal district courts said to the antitrust agencies, you're wrong. We don't believe these hospital mergers will have anti-competitive effects. And there were various reasons that the district courts gave as to why they felt there were unlikelihood of anti-competitive effects, despite their market shares, et cetera. Um, some unique to the hospital industry, some general skepticism about merger enforcement. Uh, it's hard to say. There was somewhat all over the lot. But what was certainly the persistent pattern was this string of consecutive losses. And when Chairman Muris, then Chairman Muris, joined the Federal Trade Commission in 2000, he had been studying hospital mergers throughout this time, and he felt, I believe, the law was wrong on this, that the FTC and DOJ and the state ag agencies may not have been um, worthy of winning all seven cases that they had been losing, but they should not have lost all seven. And on a number of fronts, on the analytical front, he felt that the district courts had gotten it wrong. And he wanted to bring a case to s show that the analytics were wrong with respect at least to hospital mergers. And that was one of the, I think, uh, key pieces of Evanston to show that hospital mergers can be anti-competitive and to set forth an analytical process very much along the lines of the merger guidelines, but as applied to hospital mergers, to set forth a new game plan for the uh, agencies to go forth, and they are starting to do that now with the, the recent challenge of the Innova Prince William merger in Fairfax slash Prince William County. So that set forth a new game plan. Another interesting part about the Evanston case is what I alluded to before, the question of quality of care. I don't think the antitrust laws have fully come to grips, frankly, with how to deal with pro-competitive effects of mergers once you go outside the realm of numbers. Traditionally speaking, when you talk about a merger, the key concern is from the enforcement side, will it lead to higher prices and reduction of output? And you try to measure that in some fashion in dollar amounts. How much will prices go up? Okay. Then you try to balance that against what are the pro-competitive aspects of the merger? And one of the more logical ones is cost savings. By combining two operations, how, how much in fixed costs, marginal costs, et cetera, will you save? And you try to figure out a dollar amount to that. And you balance. And it's usually net, net zero, zero. I mean, if they wash each other out, the merger's okay. But you try and quantify it, and it's easy. The merger guidelines reference the notion of improved quality and innovation. Problem is, you can't quantify these things. These are real things that do come up in mergers. Mergers can lead to greater innovation, can lead to higher quality. Problem is, how do you measure that? What number do you assign to it? So, for example, in Evanston, it was a real problem for us because we saw price increases that had actually occurred, and we could measure it. We, we could assign a dollar amount to it. But the parties came in and said, you know what, by integrating our hospitals, we were able to improve the quality of care that we provided to patients. Well, how do you measure that? Is it one life? Is it if you feel better generally? If you like the experience is much better in the room because the, 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 the walls are nicely painted? If the nurses are nicer? How do you measure that? 
And I think that's one of the challenging legacies that remain with the Evanston case is how do you measure and assess quality? Mergers definitely can improve quality, not just in hospitals, but anything. Two car companies could get together and they might be able to build a better car. How are you going to measure that? That's something I think that is, that's going to be quite a challenge going forward for the antitrust agencies as to how to measure that. Thank you. Thank you, Chul. Uh, and I'd like to turn the program over to Ed Rockefeller. I'm not confident uh, what I can say in how many minutes, uh, but I hope I may ask you to uh, stop me if I'm going on too long. Uh, for those of you who are overcome by drowsiness or have to leave, I can tell you all I'm going to say in uh, two sentences, I think, to start with. One is that these activities that uh, we have heard described so skillfully and knowledgeably, uh, these government activities are uh, not the rule of law. Uh, they are the rule of bureaucrats. I've already used two sentences. The third <laughs> sentence. <laughs> The third sentence of summary that I would offer is none of this makes any sense from a public policy point of view. Now, I don't expect to convince many people here of those three propositions, uh, but I would uh, feel better when I leave if I have at least stimulated some thinking on them. Now, as to whether this is the rule of law, let's start with the term merger enforcement. The government publishes yearly these reports, which it titles merger enforcement. And people at panels like this have to pick up that term. But if you think about it, mergers are reviewed, they're regulated, they're controlled, they're harassed, and in some cases they're prevented. But in no case are they enforced. The merger is a freely arrived at contract which people either go ahead with or don't. Now, everyone involved in this process has to talk as though a law is being enforced. And the term merger enforcement is sort of a roundabout way to uh, bring in the notion that some law is being enforced. In fact, no ascertainable rule is being enforced, and there isn't any enforcement even of the one that's being alluded to, or very little. Now, how did we get to this point? We have a statute adopted in 1914 prohibiting mergers which lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. And the statute was pretty much ignored until the late 1950s when some activists decided we're really going to enforce this law. So they brought cases against every possible merger you could think of. And in every case, with one exception, which I think I can deal with if I have to, the Supreme Court upheld the government. The Supreme Court concluded, in effect, 
all mergers are illegal. Horizontal mergers eliminate competition between the competitors. Vertical mergers eliminate some, that is, between suppliers and customers. Some competition is going to be eliminated. And then they even went as far as merging parties that are not in the same, not competing with each other and have no customer or supplier relationship. Well, they might be competitors. They're potential competitors. So that's going to be illegal too. And then they even got the theorizing, although I don't know if they've taken the Supreme Court this far yet, a difference between actual potential competitors and perceived potential competitors. So the government has now established with the Supreme Court's help that the statute means all mergers are prohibited. But then somebody woke up and said to himself, and I think it was a man named Donald Turner, having been a professor at the Harvard Law School, he says, okay, now we can prevent any merger we want to, but we're not going to prevent them all. So we ought to make some sort of announcement of which ones we're going to prevent and which ones we're not going to prevent. So somebody came up with the term guidelines. Now, if you're in this field at all, you've looked at these guidelines, and you know that they don't guide. They are just uh, doctrinal restatements, and that's all you could expect because the pro you can't expect the enforcement officials to announce, here are all the law violators we're not going to go after. Or you can't expect them to announce any rules that are going to restrict their freedom to pick on whomever they want to pick on. So we get to the point where in 2005 there were 1,695 mergers reported and 18 were challenged. And in 2006, 1,768 mergers, 32 challenged. In each case, if, if I've got the data correct and the arithmetic is correct, they're picking on less than 2% of the mergers. Now, so okay, it's very hard to call that enforcement. Non-enforcement might be a more appropriate term. It is not possible to tell which ones they're going to pick on. Which ones are they going to challenge? And if they do challenge one, it's not possible to tell whether their challenge will be sustained or not. So we don't know against whom they're going to proceed, and we don't know what the result is going to be if they do. Now, it's a little hard to call that law enforcement. Now, as to these three cases, I was asked specifically to uh, come down from the clouds and <laughs> comment a little on these three cases. What do they tell us about current FTC practice? Well, for one thing, they tell us that mergers in energy, food, and medical services are vulnerable to attack. My suspicion is because mergers in those areas uh, make it easier for the government to appear to be relevant to uh, people's concerns today. Now, secondly, uh, the question, is the commission challenging the right transactions? From my, my way of looking at it, we have no way of knowing. We, we know something about the 2% that they challenged, but we don't know anything about the 98% that they didn't. Now, are the courts and unnecessary obstacle 
or are they an appropriate check on this government action? I submit that the courts are playing the contemplated role in a rule of law system which we all want them to play. And they are being asked to find facts where no facts can be found. The problem there is the discussion in these cases has turned into talk about market and market power. And market and market power are not facts. They are theoretical economic concepts. The statute doesn't say anything about them, but you, that doesn't matter anyway. The statute talks about line of commerce and sections of the country. But when you talk about a market, the conclusion, any conclusion you reach, depends on assumptions. It depends on predictions. These are things that cannot be verified. You can't bring a witness and say, who in, get them under oath and say, I saw market power slinking around the corner. What you do is you bring an economist in who does charts and data and uh, studies and counts how many automobiles go by here and there and so on. And he's got his theory that the market is cellophane. And then the other side brings in a, his economist and he does his studies and counts things and all the data and everything. And he offers as his theory the market is flexible packaging material. And if, you, if the judge finds appealing within his human experience, one vision over the other, that's the way he decides. Generally, some experts have told me that the economists, if they're good, they cancel each other out. So the judge is forced to decide on the basis of his own whims or just sort of how he feels about it. Have I gone on too long? All right. No, I, I, now, a, a little more then on the question of can any sense be made out of all this? Well, there, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm saying things more dramatic, dogmatically than maybe uh, reality will support, just to hold your attention. Uh, but questions I would suggest if you're interested in this subject that you try to think about are, why don't we prevent all mergers? After all, as far as the Supreme Court says, they all lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. And we don't want all this, although at the present time we got all this 98% of lessening of competition and tending to monopoly going on all over the place. So why don't we present them, uh, prevent them all? Now, Mr. Pack got into suggesting a part of the problem for someone who wants to try to make sense out of antitrust is this business of a merger may enhance competition. And in the 1982 guidelines, in a footnote, when a Stanford law professor was the head of the antitrust division, they put this in. There is some economic evidence that where one or two firms dominate a market, the creation of a strong third firm enhances competition. The department has considered this evidence but is not presently prepared to balance 
this possible gain against the certainty of substantially increased concentration in the market. That footnote was taken out in the next edition of the guidelines and the question pretty much buried. Looking at it the other, well, so we don't know whether a merger may enhance competition or diminish competition. So why should we assume one way or the other? And who should do the assuming? The present system is we've got to do some assuming and we will let the decider do the assuming. Looking at it from another way, why not allow all mergers? Not just 98%. I think the answer we we don't come to that conclusion is there is a, a strong irrational fear of corporate consolidation and it doesn't matter what you say we've got to prevent some mergers it's like sacrificing goats you just can't stop it now I have some other thoughts but maybe I've gone far enough Thank you so much, and I'm sure we can address them in the Q&A session. Um, before we open the floor to questions, I'd, I'd like to pause and, and give uh, the panelists um, an opportunity to, to weigh in if they have any views on some of the uh, thoughts shared today so far, um, rebuttals or, or commentary. Okay. Well, with that, um, uh, we do have, if anyone has any questions, we do have a, a mic, so I would ask you to, to pause until we're able to, to get that into your hands. Um, Alden? Uh, yes, thanks, Peggy. Uh, Alden Abbott. Uh, quick question for John Delacourt. You mentioned a general traditional presumption that competition and allowing market forces to work is superior to relying on uh, regulation and the actions of regulatory agencies. But the Supreme Court last year in a, a Credit Suisse opinion, in effect, uh, some have read Credit Suisse as saying that there's a great, much greater scope now for regulatory activities uh, not to be, uh, for private uh, behavior in the shadow of regulatory activities not to be subject to antitrust scrutiny. Uh, what, do you think that the Credit Suisse opinion changes the traditional view of the superiority of antitrust to regulation as, 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 a, mechan as a mechanism? Well, uh, it's an interesting question. I, I think it's certainly true that um, uh, Credit Suisse is uh, grappling with those same sorts of issues. And I guess uh, where I would uh, come out on it is that um, the concern in Credit Suisse is uh, just to avoid having uh, over-regulation. So that is to avoid having, in that instance, the uh, securities regulations uh, be just a first step uh, in evaluating uh, conduct, and then on top of that, have uh, antitrust enforcement as well. And so, um, uh, you're right in that uh, it's probably not a, a panacea to say, well, um, you know, we should always prefer uh, antitrust enforcement to the sectoral regulation. That that is somehow um, a, a less intrusive hand. Um, but at the same time, it's it's not easy to distinguish those situations in which um, the, uh, the, um, the 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 two regulatory structures are going to be pulling in different directions. So, I mean, Credit Suisse. Uh, I think the the ruling there is that you don't have to have uh, perfect opposition before the antitrust laws are ousted. That some uh, lesser fear of conflict between the two regulatory regulatory structures is enough, um, and. Um, you know, I, I think that's a, a sensible rule, a sensible concern. The problem is, you know, how do you how do you define that? How do you um, articulate where the conflict uh, is taking place if you don't have a rule that's calling for, you know, 180 degree opposition? If I, if I could add something. One other way to think about Credit Suisse is not so much antitrust versus regulation, but uh, to take the opinion as further evidence of the backlash against private actions. I mean, the court 
has continued to move further and further away from private actions, make private actions more difficult. Uh, so I'm, I'm less convinced that it's about, you know, some inferiority of antitrust vis-a-vis -vis regulation than it is about concern about continuing to open up more avenues of attack for private litigation. Laura Peterson. Um, I wanted to ask, especially uh, Mr. Rockefeller, um, to what would you ascribe um, tougher antitrust policy, especially regarding um, Section 2 versus Section 82? Um, in, in Europe regarding monopolization, um, why is why is antitrust policy um, in in Europe tougher than it is here? And with respect to Section Two cases um, today, and the paucity of cases that um, I think no cases have been brought by the current administration under Section Two, do you find any? hope in that? Or do you see it just as a glitch in the scheme of things, or a, a, something relatively good but not that important? Well, I hardly know where to start. There, uh, you have a number of questions in mind. Uh, I think my response, anyway, to, as far as what the European Union does, I don't really know much about that. I think it is mistakenly uh, described by journalists as antitrust, but it's certainly government regulation of business. Uh, but uh, antitrust, in, in my way of thinking, is a peculiarly American uh, institution and set of beliefs. And uh, that's the only one I'm really trying to think about or tell other people what they ought to think about. Now, as far as Section 2 of the Sherman Act, uh, my understanding there is that even the activists don't know uh, what rule uh, are we trying to uh, find uh, out about or uh, uh, what kind of activity we're trying to prevent. We don't have any way to distinguish between, in ma as a matter of fact, between activities that are honest competition or somehow some sort of uh, reprehensible anti-competitive activity that we want to stop. And I, my impression is in the last year or so, there's been a lot of discussion uh, inside the government and, and out. Can we, is there any way we can possibly make sense out of this law? And so far, I think the answer is no. Uh, now, I guess, and, and it might be useful then for me to stay further along that line. Mr. Pack, I think, uh, alluded to what I would regard as, as uh, a big part of the problem. We don't have any uh, defini useful definition of competition, do we? We, you know, what is competition? And, and you really get to that when you're trying to struggle with this uh, Section 2 of the Sherman Act. Uh, and we certainly don't have any definition that allows you to measure whether there's more or less. And the only idea I'm working on so far is that the a possible definition of competition is the state of things or what happens when the government doesn't interfere. That's competition. It's something to think about anyway. If, if, if that's one's view, then of course uh, merger, and then you might start thinking, well, mergers are just a method of competition. The answer to the question is why do we pre prevent, prevent mergers is we don't know why. Or there isn't any reason we should. Think about it. And in your book, did you not extend that to price fixing as, as well pretty much? Price fixing, so-called price fixing, agreements between competitors about price 
are another sort of agreements. Uh, and the real believers in antitrust, that's their last fallback position when they hear any of, of, of the antitrust doctrines being uh, questioned. What about bid rigging? Isn't that awful? We got to stop that. I don't know whether the 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 only uh, published study uh, by and, and it's uh, it's uh, it's referred to in uh, Crandall and Winston's piece. These are economists at the Brookings Institution looked at everything published. And uh, the only study they could find uh, as to uh, what happens when competitors agree on price is a study that showed following indictments for price fixing, prices went up, suggesting, now they don't try to make too much out of this, but it's the only study there is. But what you can make out of that, or one is tempted to infer, the price fixers had the price fixed too low. And when the cartel was broken up, they raised their prices. Now, one can just, in theoretical terms, you can look at a, at a price fixing agreement and say there are three possibilities. They've either got the price fixed too low or they've got it fixed too high, or they've got it fixed just right. Now, if they've fixed it too low, we, why should we try to prevent that? If they fixed it just right, it doesn't make any difference anyway. And if they fixed it too high, that may be something we want to prevent, but there's no way we can tell ahead of time or at the time we're going to prosecute them which category it's in. And certainly theoretical economics would suggest that if they fixed it too high, somebody's going to cheat very soon. So that's all I can say about that, I guess. We have a question here in the front. Yeah, um, this question actually is more as a consumer. I grew up in Highland Park and my uh, parents now live there and I spent a week in Highland Park Hospital with my father who's quite ill. Um, and one thing I found interesting about Mr. Pock's comments was that even though it was clearly obvious to everyone that you had no information on what the quality effect would be, that the, the proceeding went ahead. If something as important as the quality of care to the people who ultimately matter, which is sick people. If that wasn't enough, um, the, the absence of that information wasn't sufficient. Why did you go forward? What I can, it was such a critical piece of information that whether the cost of the care having gone down um, or the care, the cost, cost of the care having gone up, that's pretty much irrelevant to the uh, end result. And I can tell you what the end result is in that suburb, which is that doctors who had been attracted by the higher cost of reimbursement are now leaving, and people who are physically unable to get to other hospitals except in ambulances are stuck. <laughs> They're stuck with Highland Park, which was a terrible hospital before about 2000, has gradually been getting better, and I suspect will now gradually get worse again. If there's such a critical piece of information as the ultimate quality of the care, and you're talking about hospitals, how could you go forward without that piece of information? So um, I'm doing mental juggles in my mind because I think to myself, all right, you were the staff attorney and the commission disagreed with you, so what can you say and what can you not say? Uh, but now I'm not with the FTC anymore, so what can I say and what can't I say? Um, on the issue of quality of care, what there were, uh, this is the staff's position now uh, as the team that litigated. The evidence that was developed had various sources. So we went to the payers, the Blue Crosses, the Aetnas, and we asked them, did you see a uh, market improvement in quality of care 
or a deterioration in quality of care compared to pre-post-merger. Quite often, well, universally, what we heard was, uh, no, they didn't see any difference in quality of care. So we said, all right, well, that's very nice anecdotally. But then we hired an expert uh, from the American Health – it's a quasi-governmental agency that tries to monitor quality of care for the U.S. government uh, on behalf of Medicare. Medicaid. And we asked him, so look, you guys, uh, you guys are the hospital experts. When you go to hospitals, how do you grade hospitals on quality of care? What do you look at? And he says the most important things we look at are mort mortality rates and morbidity rates. And prior to the case, I didn't even know what morbidity rates meant. Uh, I understood mortality rates, death rates. What are morbidity rates? Complications. Um, uh, infections occurring after a per particular medical procedure. Uh, they also looked at things like patient satisfaction questionnaires and surveys and things like that. So he took various measures into place and he st studied them and we asked him, can you look to see pre-merger, post-merger, was there any change? And he found none. In terms of, again, the raw numbers, everything stayed the same. Uh, if anything, there was some slight deterioration in quality as it measured by higher mortality post-merger than pre-merger. So I, I think we did take quality of care into account, and we tried to prove to the Commission that there were no uh, substantial improvements in quality of care that would justify the price increases. And remember, the price increases, one of the um, most harmful effects of it was prices would go up to the payers, but then the payers would ultimately spread the higher costs throughout the system. So in fact, what we saw was a lot of people outside Evanston, small businesses in fact, starting to drop health care coverage for their employees. And they never saw any of the benefits of quality improvement. So that was the, that was the um, weighing, so to speak, that we tried to do. And we felt that in the end, quality had not improved. On the other hand, prices had gone up. Um, and there were anti-competitive effects in that regard. It, now, if I could add a comment on that, I, thanks for the question because I think it is a really good uh, example of um, some of the larger points that Ed brought up, and and that's that um, you know the way you phrased the question was uh, if you didn't have um, good information about quality of care and that's an important issue, why did you go forward? And you know I think that ties in nicely with a lot of the points that Ed has made about antitrust is an area where you don't have clear rules, and so. Um, is, it, is it really realistic to talk about enforcement if we don't know what we're enforcing, et cetera? And I think that's a serious issue. I, I, I think that that's um, something that we need to think a lot about and think about developing clearer standards and clearer rules. That being said, I, I wonder, um, is this a problem that's really unique to the area of antitrust, or is this something that is pervasive throughout uh, the legal system? And, uh, you know, just in, Examples that immediately spring to mind are, um, is it any easier to define, you know, what is covered by a patent than it is to define, uh, you know, what constitutes quality of care? Is it any easier to define what constitutes defamation? Uh, is, it, is it any easier to, to define what constitutes reasonable care? I mean, these are all things where you could look at the cases and they're all over the map. Uh, what, what was reasonable care in one instance, instance uh, is found to be clearly not in another case. So um, I think that, that um, this is a real problem and something that we need to be concerned about grappling with, but at the same time, I'm not sure that it's such a damning indictment of antitrust. I mean, we live in a world with imperfect information, and um, in many situations, antitrust being one of them, you need to go forward anyway and do the best you can. Question in the back. To Mr. Rockefeller, um, the European Commission recently slapped the giant uh, Microsoft on uh, 
charges of uh, monopoly or antitrust law. How do you look at it in a legal standpoint? Is that fair enough? How do I look at what the government did or didn't do as far as Microsoft is concerned? Well, my understanding of the case is that uh, some people complained to the Federal Trade Commission about what Microsoft was doing. And two people at the Federal Trade Commission, members of the Federal Trade Commission, thought they ought to do something about it. And two others thought they shouldn't. And the fifth one owned some stock or something and said he wasn't going to participate. So we had an, at that time a uh, fairly activist assistant attorney general and for antitrust. And she said, well, they can't seem to deal with this. I'll take it on. And so she did. Uh, and I think at one point they had uh, achieved some consent decree. These guys that are more active than I am now can, can be more precise on this history. Uh, and they presented that dis consent decree to a, uh, a ju district judge. And he said, in effect, well, I read a book about this subject, or maybe two of them, and I don't think what the Attorney General is proposing here is adequate. Uh, and uh, so, but eventually the Court of Appeals told him that it wasn't his business to decide what decrees are adequate. Uh, and that was for the Attorney General to decide. Then they got another case going. And that went up and down through the courts. And at one point, they were at, in the district court. And the government was proposing to break up Microsoft. And again, you have one of these district judges who's just doing the best he can, but he can't make any sense out of it. And he said something like, I'm not making this up. It's in a memorandum, words to this effect. Well, I don't know whether the government's right or wrong, but the defendant, they're interested only in their own private interests, whereas the government, uh, they're interested in the public interest, so I'm going to decide for the government. Well, when that got reviewed in the Court of Appeals, I think what we ended up with was some sort of uh, statement from the Court of Appeals, uh, written by a judge who had himself been the head of the antitrust division and went off on some sort of tying theory that somehow Microsoft was tying two products in, in some way that they shouldn't. Now, if there's any one area in the whole antitrust field that makes absolutely no sense at all, it's tying. So that's where that case ended up. They, uh, they, uh, they sent it back and then they worked out some consent decree and, and the government could look like they hadn't lost entirely and Microsoft wasn't broken up or their business wasn't really interfered with. Now, Europe is a different story, as I say. They have a, some kind of a um, treaty provision or regulations that, that give the uh, commission authority to uh, decide whether somebody's abusing a dominant position, whatever they are. A dominance usually means making more sales than somebody else. Uh, so what goes on in Europe, I, I, I don't know, and, and I don't even try to make any sense out of it. Well, can I add something about that? What, this is an interesting question, I think, actually, because um, when we're trying to advise companies in the United States and they have international operations, I'm curious what everyone else thinks. I think there is different perceptions about how antitrust laws are viewed, certainly within the United States under the current administration, versus places like Europe and to a certain extent Asia. And it's, I think, interesting for us to see perhaps some philosophical differences 
particularly in a case like Microsoft, where we have a very large company that for one, regardless of which way you look at it, very large. Um, and I think in this current regime in the United States, we're a lot more um, forgiving, perhaps tolerant of the kinds of practices and conduct of large companies, whereas in the, uh, Europe and in Asia, I don't think they like it as much and they want to do big is bad, uh, you know, to put a, a quick sound bite to it. But the problem, I think, is for us as lawyers is how do you advise companies then that have global operations? Yeah, you, um, you put your finger on, on the hardest area, which is the, the differences between Section 2 of the Sherman Act and Article 82, the Treaty of Rome. I, mean, I, I don't know anybody who would tell you that they mean the same thing. Uh, th there's really no way to reconcile them. Whereas, you know, a lot of people will tell you, price fixing, we basically all agree. Uh, you talk to the European officials, U.S. officials, they all agree that price fixing is a bad thing. Uh, they think the same way about mergers, pretty much. You know, differences at the margin, but essentially the same framework for thinking about things. Article 82 and Section 2, not even close. Uh, so you really, you have to go to the lowest common denominator, is my view. I mean, if to protect yourself against liability, uh, you have to recognize what the lowest common denominator is. And the other thing you need to think about when you're dealing with the European Commission is that they have a lot more power than the Federal Trade Commission or the Justice Department has. Uh, and the notion of judicial review that we're very fond of here, and that we view as a check on the government going too far, is a very different animal in Europe. I mean, judicial review is, is not nearly as forceful as it is here. I mean, we've seen the commission reverse, the European Commission, that is. But it takes a long time, and it's not clear that it has a huge impact on them, whereas judicial review in this country is much more immediate, uh, and I, I think much more effective. Um, maybe just to, to, to wrap up with maybe one last one question. More, oh, one oh, one oh I'm sorry. Corner. I apologize. In the corner. <laughs> You're black, but podium blocked my view. Uh, when Mr. Park was uh, talking about uh, the, uh, looking at the hospital price increases as a way of determining that uh, there was a, a monopoly power in the hospital case, how do you distinguish between an increase in monopoly power and an increase in market efficiency, which in the case of a rising cost to the two companies that are merging, would simp simp the merger would cause the price to go up quicker, according to so that was part of the regression analysis that both sides experts had to try to figure out. Obviously, price increases alone meant nothing. The question was, were they anti-competitive price increases that were attributable to the merger? So the regression analysis, and it's very technical, Ted underst understands it much better, uh, but I had the misfortune of having to speak to the judge to try to explain it. So that's what I'll try to do to you. Uh, you've got like 10 potential things that can cause the price increases across the board, either at these particular hospitals or citywide in Chicago. And you try to gauge it. I mean, is it increased cost, increased nursing uh, costs, inflation? What exactly was happening? Did something else happen at the two merging hospitals? For example, did they have more complicated cases um, than the other hospitals? And again, you try to run the numbers factor in all those through your regression analyses, and then you reach a conclusion or an opinion, and at least in this case, everyone fairly uh, agreed, at least, um, well, first, our expert thought it's only because of the merger. When you account for everything else that was going on in the world, the only reason that can account for the fact that these hospitals had higher price increases than anybody else in the neighborhood to the same payers was the merger. And then that was bolstered by things like the company's um, documents, corporate documents saying pre-merger and post-merger, we believe we were able to get higher prices because of the merger. So that's how you balance it out. But it's, it's, if I understood your correct question correctly, it's principally an econometrics regression uh, question. And you try to control for all the various the variables that might account for the price increases. Did I get it right, Ted? I don't know. 
I'll tell you a okay. sim simpler version of it. Think, think of natural experiments that have happened in the marketplace and look at what happened during those events. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you want to see, uh, you're worried about a merger, for example, maybe there was a time where one of the plants of the merging parties blew up, right, and was down for some prolonged period of time. What happened then? Uh, so you can look anecdotally, I mean, you, the, the really rigorous way, as Chul's describing it, uh, certainly has a lot of appeal. Uh, econometricians will tell you that they can study almost anything and give you an answer. That's probably a little exaggerated. Uh, their tools are good, but they're not that good. But uh, if you want to really get your case across to a judge who is not an econometrician, it's nice to have some anecdotes some of these natural experiments where you can simplify things and try to show where there is an effect, where there's not an effect. So take real live examples. Uh, that doesn't perfectly control for everything as Chul and his colleagues were trying to do, but at least gets across the basic intuition of what you're trying to prove. And then you can back it up with some good econometrics. Could I ask a question for information, not uh, to uh, prolong a debate, but am I right in thinking that economic analysis, uh, econometric analysis, depends on assumptions. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. No, no question about that. Thank you. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> Great. No. Go ahead, Joel. No. 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 Any? Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Well, I think we've uh, reached our, our time. I would like to take a moment to thank our panelists for their thoughtful contributions this afternoon. And, uh, and uh, thanks also to the Federal Society and the Antitrust Subcommittee for organizing. Thank you very much for coming today. And thanks for